welcome to the 700 Club, a spending orgy. That's what President Biden is peddling as a $2 trillion, quote, infrastructure bill. Even worse, it's funded by a mammoth tax increase. So how will this enormous burden cripple the American family? And what shocking impact will it have on our children and our grandchildren? Jenna Browder has that. It's still too early to tell if both sides can strike a deal. This week, the president is meeting with senators from both parties. Still, he's pushing the definition of what's considered infrastructure. It's about investing in infrastructure, not for the 20th century, but the 21st century. The president says he's sincere about reaching a compromise on his expensive spending plan. As the administration makes its latest attempt to broaden what's traditionally been called infrastructure. I think broadband is infrastructure. It's not just roads, bridges, highways, etc. So that's what we're going to talk about, and uh, I'm confident everything's going to work out perfectly. And talking directly to Americans by releasing fact sheets that define infrastructure in 12 categories. It grades all 50 states and the District of Columbia and argues how each would benefit. We're willing to negotiate a, a much smaller package. Republicans, though, say the price tag on the president's $2.3 trillion plan is way too high and have deep-seated doubts about its scope. Senator Roger Wicker of Mississippi voiced his concerns before Monday's meeting with the president. You've got a proposal here of $2.3 trillion, 70% of which cannot, by any stretch of the, ma the imagination, be called infrastructure. That's on top of $1.9 trillion a few weeks ago, most of which was not COVID-related. We're told another $2 trillion is on the way, and that's on top of this $1.5 trillion skinny federal budget that the, the president rolled out just uh, this past week. And an editorial today from the Wall Street Journal argues Biden's bill is actually a plan to remake the economy and contains enough spending and industrial planning that it amounts to the Green New Deal in disguise. It's true, just a fraction of the bill would go to traditional infrastructure. Broken down by Politico's estimate, only around 37 percent of the measure, or about $820 billion, would be used for transportation, electricity and Internet. Republicans and some Democrats also oppose the plan's proposed corporate tax hike from 21 to 28 percent. This all coming as the U.S. deficit jumps to a record $1.7 trillion for just the first six months of this budget year, nearly double the previous record, and with more Democratic spending bills still to come. This is a massive social welfare spending program combined with a massive tax increase on small business job creators. I, I can't think of a worse thing to do. And the president's meetings with lawmakers will continue through this week. He says he hopes to have progress made on his infrastructure plan by Memorial Day. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Ladies and gentlemen, the future of your children and grandchildren is at stake because if these socialists have their way, there won't be an America left for your children because we'll be so deeply in debt. That's the price that, we're, that these people are asking us to pay, is to take America away and the future away from your children and grandchildren. And I don't want it to happen to mine, and I hope you don't want it to happen to yours. But that's what is being, they don't care about the future because they're going to take your country away from you and your country away from your children. And there is no way under heaven that we'll be able to pay back this debt. It'll be so massive, so massive, that the United States will not be the country we recognize anymore. But do they care? Apparently they don't care. All they care about is moving forward the socialist agenda. And I'm just so glad when I hear uh, a statement by Senator Manchin of West Virginia, who said, <clears throat> look, in the past, we, we, we had a, a, a discussion of what we were doing. We had votes on the other side. And when we were finished, everybody agreed on a particular program, and we got it through the Congress, and it was accepted by the American people. If there are no Republican votes in this, and if it's jammed through the Senate, and they put through some a procedural gimmick to get it through, 
the American people will re resent it, and it will be a, a bone of contention, and this country will be torn apart. But we don't want socialism. Well, in other news, more violent protests in Minnesota overnight, forcing police in riot gear to fire gas canisters and flashbang grenades. How did it happen? How did a police officer mistake a taser gun for her weapon? Ephraim Grimm has that story. Pat protesters and police faced off in the Minneapolis suburb of Brooklyn Center hours after the governor announced a curfew from dusk to dawn. When the protesters failed to disperse, police in riot gear began firing gas canisters and flashbang grenades. Some people broke into area businesses and began looting. The second night of demonstrations came after police said they believed the killing of 20-year-old Dante Wright was an accident. Police pulled him over for a traffic stop. He then tried to flee. The firing officer says she's pulled her gun, but she meant to use her taser. It is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. The officer could be heard on tape warning Wright she would tase him. She's been placed on administrative leave. Turning now to Washington, President Biden has nominated two critics of President Trump's immigration policies for key roles at the Department of Homeland Security. He named Tucson, Arizona Police Chief Chris Magnus for Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection. Magnus publicly challenged Trump administration's efforts to punish cities that refuse to cooperate with tougher immigration enforcement policies. Er Mendoza Jadal was nominated for Director of Citizenship and Immigration Services. She was director of DHS Watch, which critical, was critical of the Trump administration policies to curtail legal and le illegal immigration. The move comes as Biden's administration has made a deal with Mexico, Honduras and Guatemala to send security forces to their border to try to reduce the surge of immigration to the United States. We turn now overseas. Russia's foreign minister was asked today why it has tens of thousands of troops deployed along Ukraine's eastern border. He replied, the answer is very simple. We live there. It is our country. Moscow has amassed troops, tanks, artillery and armed personnel carriers along its shared border with Ukraine in recent weeks, prompting concerns in Washington and European capitals about Russia's ambitions. George Thomas takes a closer look. Folks living along Ukraine's border with Russia are once again bracing for possible war. People in eastern Ukraine are really scared. Michael Cherenkov with the Christian group Mission Eurasia just returned from the front line. Mission Eurasia runs several bread-making facilities in the war zone. Cherenkov says recent violence between Ukrainian soldiers and Russian-backed separatists has everyone there on edge. They expect a Russian invasion uh, anytime. Moscow has reportedly massed more than 80,000 troops in recent weeks along Ukraine's eastern border. Peter Dickinson with the Atlantic Council tells CBN News the world should be concerned about Russia's deployment of tanks, artillery and armored personnel carriers. The build-up is certainly designed to give the impression that Russia is prepared to launch a major offensive. Ukraine's president, following a recent tour with soldiers on the border, urged Russia to pull its troops back. Stephen Pfeiffer, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, tells CBN News that Moscow's tactic is to scare the government in Kiev and also test the West's reaction. This is basically Russian saber rattling designed to unnerve Kiev. Uh, the, the Russians do this periodically, although this is quite... Uh, different in terms of the scale. Secretary of State Antony Blinken expressing concern about Russia's troop buildup. We have real concerns about Russia's actions on the borders of Ukraine. There are more Russian forces massed on those borders than at any time since 2014. The question is, uh, is Russia going to continue to act aggressively and recklessly? If it does, uh, the president's been clear, there'll be cost. The White House, however, not saying whether the U.S. would intervene if Moscow launched an invasion. Still, two U.S. Navy destroyers are headed to the Black Sea as a warning to Russia. Ukrainian forces and Russia-backed separatists have been fighting in eastern Ukraine since Moscow's 2014 annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. More than 14,000 people have died in the conflict as efforts to reach a peace agreement have stalled.
Meanwhile, Cherenkov's group remains in the war zone, helping not only feed the hungry, but also share the gospel with those living on the front lines. We encourage local people to trust God, to pray, and that's our uh, Christian message, just to turn their uh, hearts toward God and uh, Jesus Christ. George Thomas, CBN News. Of course, many watching to see exactly how the United States will respond. Pat. Now, the Ukraine had intermediate nuclear weapons, and they gave them up on the assurance that NATO would defend them against some kind of Russian in, 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 uh, aggression. And it did not happen when Russia to move in and took the Crimea. And it looks like the, the NATO is not going to defend them now. And uh, Terry, you, you've been working in the Ukraine with Orphans Profit. Well, what do you got over there? Well, we have a lot of work done in the war zone right now because yeah. there are many people who there are many people who've left, but there are many people who have nowhere to go. Yeah. So, just providing food, doing something with the children, making the word of God known is a what big deal. What are those people saying, though? I mean, are, are they afraid that the Russians? Oh, I think be they're war? very afraid. And. You know that, well, you saw a number of years ago when that invasion happened and Kiev was at the center of it, Kiev was. I mean, these are, you know, there are a lot of young guys who've lost their lives, a lot of, you know, they're, nobody's really come to their defense the way they need to. Mm. The United States hasn't provided them with enough for what they're facing. I mean, well, this is a... trade, essentially. They, 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 they had the intermediate nukes and they gave them up. And so it's, uh, I mean... We're betraying a lot of people because yes. we, I guess, say we can't be the world's policemen. But um, anyhow, they're from what's next. Pat, as the U.S. re-enters re negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program, some say helping those being held in prison in Iran, including Christians and Muslims, must be part of the deal. Jennifer Wishon explains. Christians and other religious minorities face imprisonment and torture in Iran, because they're seen as a threat to the Islamic regime. Yusuf Nadakani is the leader of the evangelical church in Iran. He was pastoring a thriving flock of 400 members when he was violently arrested in 2018. It was his most recent in a long record of run-ins with Islamic law enforcement that included being sentenced to death, all for practicing his Christian faith. He's currently incarcerated at the nation's notorious Evan prison and he's not alone. Iran routinely mistreats, imprisons, and tortures non-Muslims. The Iranian government must be held accountable for their abhorrent treatment of Pastor Yusuf. Now, as the Biden administration works to reestablish talks with Iran over its nuclear program, religious freedom advocates say the U.S. must use every ounce of leverage to help the persecuted. The continued unjustified detainment of prisoners like Pastor Yusuf increasingly jeopardizes Iran's already unstable position. Commissioner Johnny Moore quoted Wang Shen Yu, an American who was held hostage for three years in the same prison that houses Pastor Yusuf. Iran has demonstrated that it changes its behavior only in response to strength in the form of American-led international pressure. If the present administration returns to the JCPOA without extracting concessions from Iran beyond the nuclear threat, it will relinquish all U.S. leverage over the regime. Diplomacy can't succeed without leverage. Appeals to the Biden administration came during a hearing to highlight the Prisoners of Conscience program sponsored by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Family members advocated for their loved ones who've been jailed for their faith or belief. Susanna Coe spoke about her husband, Raymond, who served as pastor of the Evangelical Church of Malaysia before disappearing during this well-orchestrated abduction. He loves to tell Bible stories to whoever that is willing to listen. And since the commission began its Prisoners of Conscience program, 14 have been released. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Troubling stories of persecution. Pat? You know, I think they're right when they tell it. Those people will not react merely to verbal uh, messages. You cannot talk them out of it. You've got to force them into doing things. And if they think there is a price to be paid for their conduct, then they might reform. Without it, it's not going to happen.
fired last month by President Biden. And the question is, why? In 2019, Sharon Gustafson became the first woman to serve as top lawyer of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So what did Sharon uncover about the EEOC that's deeply disturbing? And how could her dismissal hurt people of faith in the workplace? Heather Sells has an explanation. Sharon Gustafson has worked in employment law for decades, including arguing before the Supreme Court. In 2019, she became the first woman to serve as general counsel for the EEOC. In early March, however, she found herself fired by her new boss, President Biden. I was given no reason at all for um, the termination. But she had some clues. Weeks before the Biden administration asked for her resignation, Gustafson discovered that the final report on her religious discrimination work group had disappeared from the EEOC website. The agency enforces anti-discrimination laws across the board, and while it has defended employees' religious rights for years, Gustafson noticed an exception. I had never seen any case that was brought to protect somebody who was discriminated against because they had um, traditional religious beliefs about sexual morality. So I started thinking, I wonder what other sorts of uh, religious beliefs people may have that they feel are not protected. So I set up a religious discrimination work group. Gustafson says that although the group would include all faiths, it faced internal opposition, even from leadership. Well, who told me? that they were uncomfortable with it. She also faced pushback after taking on the Kroger grocery chain for firing two employees after they refused to wear gay pride aprons. They simply said that because of their religious beliefs, they could not celebrate this. LGBTQ advocates also spoke out against her work group, including revisions to a compliance manual concerned that religious beliefs would be used to discriminate against sexual orientation. Gustafson argues it's possible to protect both. All of these people can be protected at the same time. The law requires it, and it's the EEOC's job to find a way to do that. Gustafson may never know exactly what triggered her firing. It's almost become tradition that political appointees in certain areas resign when administrations change. Two of her predecessors did so even though they had time left in their term. Still, there's also precedent for general counsels staying with new presidents of other political parties. Going forward, there is concern that her firing will have a negative impact for workers who face discrimination for their beliefs. I think what's, what is going to happen is that this will have a chilling effect upon religious expression in the workforce. The word gets out, you know, to the public generally that the EEOC is not interested in these types, uh, certain types of religious discrimination claims, and that is to everybody's loss. EEOC Commissioner Andrea Lucas calls the firing deeply troubling and warns that religious liberty has become a disfavored or second-class right in many areas of our society. But a spokeswoman for the commission told CBN News the EEOC has a long history of defending against discrimination based on religion in the workplace and will continue to vigorously enforce those laws. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and we can't work on Saturdays. There's also an encouraging new movement in the private sector that urges people to bring their whole selves to work, including their faith. A number of top companies are creating faith-oriented employee groups alongside LGBTQ employee groups. It's a movement that Gustafson applauds. We need to make sure that the federal government is fairly protecting all workers, that nobody has any reason to believe that certain rights supersede other rights or are somehow given higher priority. Heather Sells, CBN News. You know, when you get down to the Bill of Rights, the first right that's guaranteed is the right to worship God. Uh, that was considered by the founders of this nation absolutely uh, primary. 
uh, in a person's ex existence. Now it is not. Now it just doesn't take the same precedent. And uh, I remember uh, talking to uh, Cardinal O'Connor about what was being done in relation to Georgetown. They were being forced uh, to make accommodation for gays uh, in their um, entire curriculum. And uh, he said, I will not do it. And uh, he said, I'll close the school down before I do that. Well, the, you know, that's the way it was. But they said uh, in the District of Columbia that the rights of gay people were really more important than their religious beliefs. Now, what the EEOC is going to do, it will depend on uh, whatever is happening. But it, apparently Sharon Gustafson was fired because of her strong stand for uh, the primacy of faith in a person's life. And, you know, what are we going to do? Well, we're, we're facing an onslaught, believe me, it's an onslaught against people who have traditional views of human sexuality and of gender identity. That's all going by the board and it's being related or relegated to second class citizenship. And this firing they can cover it up all they want to, but that's clearly what it was intended to say. We don't care about your views on sexuality. What we care about is put, pushing the LBDQ agenda. That's what we're going to get through from this administration. One more time, your rights are being trampled on. And that's the way it is. And the getting worse. It's getting worse. And, and they also... <laughs> By the way, if you're concerned about the Second Amendment, they're going after your guns, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's big time going after them. I, 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 we have a police force here at Regents and CBN, so I'm not concerned so much about the ability to carry a firearm, but the Second Amendment, people are very, very concerned about that. Yeah, well, it's the speed with which it's all happening, too. And it's, it's, it's one party. It's, it's not any consensus. Mm -hmm. Do not ask the Republicans what they want. Do not try to build a consensus. Yeah. Let's jam it through. Let's take away the filibuster. Let's, let's just push everything through by executive order. And Biden just keeps signing these executive orders without asking anybody. He closed the Keystone Pipeline without asking anybody, just a stroke of the pen, it's over. Well, that was unconstitutional because it was an act of Congress. But well, nothing any... happens. Huh? But nothing happens. Nothing happens so far, but I think it will sooner or later. Prepare for the worst. That's what the doctor told Jennifer Scott after her son had been hit by a minivan traveling 45 miles an hour. Brendan was in the ICU with a litany of injuries and broken bones. He'd already bled out four times. His doctor said Brendan's condition was desperate. So why did his mother refuse to lose hope? Take a look. Rural Mason, Michigan. A minivan was passing a slow moving combine when a small figure appeared from nowhere. We both heard the tires screeching. Then I turned and looked, and Brendan was laying in the road. First thought was fear. Richard and Jennifer Scott's nine-year-old son, Brendan, was running across the street to the neighbors when the minivan hit him at 45 miles per hour, knocking him 75 feet down the road. His body looked pretty twisted. They arrived to find his eyes open, but unresponsive, and blood coming from his ear. I immediately thought he was already gone. I just kept reminding Brendan that God has him, mom and dad are right here, and to keep fighting. God, please don't take my baby. That's, those were the only words. After calling 911, Jennifer texted her church's prayer chain with a simple message. Prayer is Brendan. And as soon as I hit send, the comments started coming, like praying, praying in a calm really did come over me because I knew God was working. Brandon was taken to Sparrow Hospital in Lansing, Michigan with both legs and his jaw broken. He also suffered a punctured lung, a ruptured spleen, and a brain hemorrhage. Even then, the most life-threatening concern was the extensive bleeding from his liver. Dr. Stephen Gurton was one of several doctors on Brandon's case. He was in desperate condition and the essential thing was to get to the operating room 
get into his abdomen and try to get the bleeding stopped. With her son in surgery, Jennifer reflected on how, after many years of praying to have children, she and Richard welcomed Brendan into the world. Now with two more boys and two adopted girls, they once again leaned on their faith in God as their firstborn fought for his life. I was definitely scared. I had to rely on him for the strength. I knew that Brendan was my miracle child when I conceived him, and he still has miracles in him. In the OR, the team was still trying to stop the bleeding when Brendan's heart stopped. He actually bled to death in the operating room. There was no more blood in his heart. And so what they did was the surgeon literally took the heart in his hands, and as the heart started to fill, he started squeezing it. By now, more people had joined the family in prayer as the team continued massaging Brendan's heart. But doctors knew that any attempts after 20 minutes would likely be futile. When they got to the 20 minute mark or so, people started to question, can we really go further? Will it help him to go further? And literally, right at that moment, um, his heart started again by itself, spontaneously. It was a win, but his liver was still bleeding, and Dr. Gurton gave the parents little hope. I, I just didn't know if he could make it. And his mother just looked at me with this just certainty that I was sort of surprised by. And she said, no, you're wrong. He, he's going to live. I couldn't let myself believe that anything but a miracle was about to happen. And the Scots say it did, as doctors were able to stop the bleeding. Now in the pediatric ICU, Brennan faced another fight. With extensive head injuries, doctors feared he would have permanent brain damage. They said he might not make it through the next couple days. To see him laying there, fighting for his life, was just really hard. Meanwhile, prayers continued to pour in from everywhere. If it wasn't for the support, I don't know how we would have made it through the first night. The nine-year-old made it through the night, and over the next few critical days, they watched for positive neurological signs. Then on day five, Brendan woke up, not only able to respond to verbal commands, but a special touch from mom. He's never liked to hold my hand like this. It's always. And so whenever I would grab his hand and I would hold on to it, he would slowly get it started with the pinky. And then eventually he just would lace his fingers through mine and I just knew that he was telling me, Mom, I'm here. I just couldn't believe it. The fact that he was alive, but also the fact that he clearly was with it. It was amazing. Brendan underwent a total of eight surgeries during his four-week stay in the hospital before going to rehab. But it only took three weeks, not several months, as doctors predicted, for him to go home. And they're like, we can't explain this, and the body shouldn't be able to heal that fast. You don't have to explain it to me. I know where it's coming from. Within a few months, he was back to running around and even riding his bike. I knew in my heart that God wouldn't take my child, but even I didn't imagine that he would restore him fully. He represents one of the best examples I can think of in a lifetime of doing this. Other than the scars and brief moments of memory loss, Brendan shows no signs of long-term effects from his injuries. He and his family know he's a walking miracle and a testament to the power of prayer. The Bible says, where two or more come to me in my name, the prayers will be answered. And we had countless numbers of prayers coming in. God actually does miracles. This just proved God's willing to answer if you're willing to ask. I hope that's encouraging to you today as you look at the things in your own life that are challenging and maybe even seem impossible because God is the God of miracles. You saw it in this story for this little boy and God will do it for, for will, you as well as we pray will. today. Here, here's one uh, in Springdale, Pennsylvania, somebody named Terry, not the same one that's here, started experiencing terrible problems with her jaw and mouth. Her jawbone was actually protruding. 
Well, she was watching on April the 5th of this year. Terry said there's someone with a jaw that's just clicking. It's made any, any difficult. Jesus is healing you. The click is gone. Terry of Springdale, Pennsylvania, believed the healing was for her. Within an hour and a half, the swelling of her gums left, and she could move her jaw Praise without God. pain. Isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. Yeah. Well, Pat, this is Kirk. He lives in Kelseyville, California. Pulled a muscle, which caused excruciating pain. He finally fell asleep at 4 a.m. The next day, he's watching this program, and he hears you say, somebody, you pulled a muscle. It really is hard. I don't know if you were going up some steps and fell or what happened, but you are in great pain. Just touch that part of your anatomy. Your muscle is going to be completely healed. Well, by faith, Kirk believed it was for him. He was totally healed. He has no more pain. Folks, God is no respecter of persons. He mm -hmm. loves you. He loves you. And Terry and I are going to pray together for you. We're going to believe God for you. And I want you just to reach out. And please, as we pray, don't say it's not for me. Don't say it's not from today. Don't say it won't happen. But you say yes, and you believe God and agree with the Holy Spirit right now. We're going to pray together. Father, I join with my sister in Christ, and we pray together for people in this audience. There's so many who are suffering. Somebody, you've got a hemorrhage in your, in your stomach. I don't know if it's what they call a bleeding ulcer. Or there's something worse than that. Uh, but um, it may be that uh, there's been some kind of trauma, but there's bleeding in, in your abdominal region. Reach down in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Be healed. Uh, Terry. Yes, someone else, you have bleeding in your eye. I don't know if it's a detached retina or what it is, but um, you're, you're being treated for it, but it's serious, and your, your vision is imperiled by it. God is healing that for you right now. Uh, those spots that you see are just going to go away, and your vision is going to be completely restored. Uh, there's somebody named Michael, and you have night sweats. Mm. Uh, your, your body is, 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 has got within it a, a virus, and the virus is being, it may be something like mononucleosis, but whatever it is, that virus is going away, and you are being healed in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Terry. Someone else, you have anxiety issues. You just out of nowhere will have these attacks that really undo you. God is, is just changing all of that for you. He's just touching you now from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. The peace of heaven come into your heart and mind now in Jesus' name. Uh, there's somebody, I believe the name is Nicola, and you're having a real problem with uh, an emotional attachment, some kind of relationship, and you're praying to God about it, and God says to you, I've got it under control. I've heard your prayer, and you're going to have an answer. Now, Lord, for all over this audience, may the anointing of the Holy Spirit touch them. May they know the power of God in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. amen. And amen. Please give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Now, look, if you need further prayer, we've got folks on the phones right now. All you have to do is pick up the phone, and it's easy to remember. It's a toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Somebody's here who loves you. And give us a testimony of what God has done. We, we love to share these as well. Mm -hmm. Concern over potentially dangerous blood clots with the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine may halt its distribution. Both the FDA and CDC are recommending a pause in administering the vaccine to investigate reports of blood clots in the brains of six women that happened within two weeks of their receiving the drug. Johnson & Johnson says no link has been established. Nearly 7 million doses of the vaccine were given in the U.S. with little or mild side effects. Let Us Worship leader Sean Foyt has received the William J. Seymour Award, an honor given to leaders in ministry who exhibit the characteristics of the late Bishop Seymour. Foyt has been traveling the nation with his worship events and helping to lead revivals wherever he goes. Foyt says since the start of the pandemic, his heart has been on revival, and he is not backing down from officials who tried to shut down his events or tech that has tried to stop his music. He told CBN News he believes there's a calling on believers to obey God rather than man. But at the end of the day, he simply wants to see revival in our nation. 
want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. So picture this. A baby crying to nurse, a toddler fussing at the table, dogs whining to be let out, and a microwave incessantly beeping that breakfast is getting cold. No wonder Mo Aiken had a meltdown right on her kitchen floor. The good news? She didn't stay there. Take a look. Mo Isom Aiken is a New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and former soccer player for LSU. If you're feeling burned out, distant, or disheartened in your walk with God, she wants to help. In her new book, Fully Known, Mo invites you to discover God's blueprint for continually growing intimately closer to Him. Welcome back to the 700 Club, Mo. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you guys again. So tell me about that morning on the kitchen floor when you felt like you had lost it. At the same time that that was happening, you did hear a whisper. Talk to me about what happened. Yeah, I, I think back to really a, a compilation of moments where um, it was just tough. It was hard. I, I remember doing so many wonderful things, pouring myself out, serving, working to build the kingdom, but kind of coming up for air and realizing my spirit felt so far from God. Yeah. And he met me with some challenging scripture with Matthew 7, 21 through 23, which really says, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It goes on to, to say that to many, I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that word knew, knew you. I just began to wrestle with it. God, what does this mean? Because I know you haven't left me or forsaken me, but but I'm struggling here and I don't know that I know you. Uh, I don't, I don't feel that intimacy. And it's actually through what seems like kind of a scary piece of scripture. He revealed the beauty of the invitation to be known and to know him, that Hebrew root being yada, yada intimacy is the most connective, deep layered type of oneness. Mm -hmm. And when he met me with that invitation to know him, uh, really in a yada intimacy form, it just unpacked this blueprint of invitation from the maker of the heavens and the earth uh, to, to draw near to him and to experience revival even in my own heart. So well, what did that look like? Like here you were feeling this emptiness and a lot of the pressure still going on around you. How did you pursue that? Well, it's interesting, probably an unconventional way. I had been ministering for a while off of my second book, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot. So really the thoughts of sexuality, of sex, they were kind of always on the forefront of our minds as we ministered in that space. But I realized in the text that this yada intimacy was the same form of the word used when it would speak of uh, a man had not yet known his wife, or he took his wife and he knew her. And I said, God, what does this mean that you're sort of tying together relational intimacy, even sexual intimacy, as you uh, communicate the depth of your invitation? Um, and he began to just unpack piece by piece for me in a way that I could see and understand this bride and bridegroom relationship this intimacy that we knew in the garden that was broken when we chose our own way, but that Christ came to, to break down those, those prison gates, those brothel doors, really, when we're enslaved to our sin, to set us free and to make a covenant of marriage with us. And then what that intimacy looks like in marriage, oh, it was the most incredible picture he began to unpack. Because admittedly, I had a lot of um, misunderstandings about good, healthy, right-natured intimacy. So he took me piece by piece to heal those, to show his way, his heart, to restore in me my understanding of what uh, pure covenantial love looks like and how that ultimately transforms us and sanctifies us. Mo, well, you say that that intimacy comes with a great cost. What do you mean mm -hmm. by that? Well, think about a covenant. Think about the covenant of marriage. It's it's never one-sided. It's never, hey, I'll give everything I have. And then uh, the other party saying, well, make sure it keeps me happy or else. <laughs> There's a, a beautiful mutual commitment in the covenant of marriage that 
Christ has given all for us. He has paid it all. But that doesn't mean we abuse that grace and go off living flippantly or maybe in and out of communion with him. It means that we say, you gave everything for me, then my life is yours. I will give it all. You have, you know, you speak to me, you you tend to me, you heal me, then let my life be a reflection of that. And truly living a Christ-surrendered life in communion with God. It doesn't always feel great. It doesn't always make us happy. It's a real sanctifying process, but it does bear kingdom fruit, spirit conceived fruit that, um, man, it it shifts the decisions in our lives. Generosity becomes a big move. Self-sacrifice becomes a big move. We begin to look a lot more like Christ and that's not without cost. That's not always with comfort. But the beauty is that we know communion and we know that those are empowered by God's grace. Well, I just want to mention to folks who are watching today that Mo's book is called Fully Known. It is so inviting and it's available wherever books are sold. I highly recommend it. An invitation to true intimacy with God. Mo, thank you so much. Beautifully written and happy new baby whenever that happens. (laughs) Someday soon, right around the corner. (laughs) God bless you. Great to have you with us today. Just imagine waking up hungry and not knowing if you'll have any food to eat at all. Then seeing carts of dead bodies rolling down the road. These are the childhood memories that haunt a Holocaust survivor named Lisa. Recently, her trauma intensified because of the COVID pandemic. So how is Lisa coping during the lockdown? Take a look. Lisa is a Holocaust survivor who lives in Israel. The stress of the COVID-19 lockdowns and forced isolation have caused her painful memories of life in a Ukrainian ghetto to resurface. I was seven when we were forced by the Nazi into the ghetto. Food was very hard to come by. And you'd wake up not knowing if you'd have anything at all to eat that day. Then each evening we see carts going down the road filled with the bodies of those who starved to death. The constant hunger she experienced those years in the ghetto left a lasting psychological burden she carries to this day. That feeling of hunger is just stuck deep down inside me. It's a trauma shared between us Holocaust survivors and the separation and fear caused by this virus has made it worse. Because of her age and the risk of catching the coronavirus, Lisa isn't able to go grocery shopping like she normally would. So CBN Israel brings her food and checks up on her while taking extra precautions to keep her safe. I think it's amazing that you would want to do this for me. Thanks to CBN Israel donors, Lisa and other Holocaust survivors across the country have the comfort of knowing they'll have food to eat and someone to look after them through this crisis. I am so very thankful for you and your support. It means everything to know that you remember us. May God bless you and protect you. You know, we care. The Lord cares. He loves those people. He loves people everywhere. And he said, you know, when he comes back, he's going to bring people before him and say, look, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison. You came to me. And they said, well, who you do? Who are you talking about? We didn't see you. He said, well, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren. And so Lisa is one that's part of the Israeli family. And we love our Jewish brothers and sisters. And we want to help her. So we've got something in Israel that looks after people like Lisa. That's one of many, 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 many people who have helped through Operation Blessing and other parts of the CBN ministry. So how do you help Lisa? Well, you can do it when you join the 700 Club because that's part of what we do is to go out and help people who are hurting. And we also want to get the gospel around the world. The telephone number is 1-800-700-7000. And uh, we'd love to have you as a member. It's just 65 cents a day. And there's something I, I want to tell you. Uh, we have gotten available my book, I Walk with the Living God. It's a testimony of years and years of walking with God, of overcoming power over the devil, over 
of seeing impossible uh, obstacles fade away because of God's goodness. And we'll give this book to you as our gift when you join the 700 Club. All you got to do is pick up the phone. Just 65 cents a day, less than a can of soda pop. All right. Mm -hmm. This is Ray Lynn. Yeah. She lives in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. She's already received her book. And she says, thank you so much for I have walked with the living God. It's brought back inspiration into my life, especially now with the COVID virus. Knowing that I have a God who loves me unconditionally is enough. So she loved the book. That's and true. I believe others well, are going to love and it too. And God loves her. That's the thing. Yes. God loves her. We'll send this book to you again. You can get it wherever books are sold. But if you want a copy from here, all you got to do is pick up the phone and mm -hmm. we'll send it as when you join the 700 Club. Okay, let's have some questions. Questions. All right. This is from Andrea who says, Hi, Pat. I make jewelry using gemstones. I hear that certain ones can help reduce stress and relieve headaches or give the wearer more energy or boost their self-esteem. As a Christian, I've steered away from these claims because I didn't want to cross over into witchcraft. However, I know that the God I served created everything under heaven and gives everything its power. Should I be making claims that certain gemstones can help people if they wear them? Absolutely not, because they don't. Uh, this is nonsense. Um, stones are stones if they're pretty and you like them. I mean, you know, I, I think certain stones are lovely. And the Bible talks about stones mm -hmm. in, in the kingdom of God and all kinds of stones in heaven and all that. So God created the beautiful stones. But don't make any claims that they're going to have heat and they're going to have ma magic powers and they'll heal people. No way, no how. Okay. This is Nancy who says, Pat, my brother has a girlfriend who practices voodoo. He is a lonely senior citizen and the girl is young enough to be his daughter. My brother professes to be a Christian, but I'm concerned that his relationship with this girl is preventing him from having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm his only family member. How do I pray for him to be delivered from this relationship? Well, I don't think I'd pray with it. You know, voodoo has to do with, uh, it's from Africa. It has to do with worshiping ancestors and and, uh, you know, they have a sort of a demonic uh, spirits with ancestors. You need to get to him the actual belief of these people and show him what they're, believe, they're, what they're doing and then say, this is wrong and you shouldn't do it. But don't just say, hey, voodoo's bad. Well, why is it bad? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's something that they practice in Africa and they brought it to it's there to some measure in New Orleans and it was there for some measure in Haiti. And it's it's not a good thing, but it comes out of Africa, and it's, it's bad. So just show him that, all right? This is Kathy who says, can abortion be forgiven? Am I going to hell? Can I ever feel clean again? I might be meeting God soon, and this haunts my soul. Look, the Bible says, I want to make it clear, all manner of sins and, and blasphemy will be forgiven the sons of men. And that includes murder. And if you look at abortion as, as murder, God will forgive you. You need to confess it. Confess yes. it and forsake it, and God will forgive you. It's just that simple. And then you need to believe His Word that you have been forgiven. Mm -hmm. You have a time for one more? Okay, this is Erica who says, I love watching you every day. How can you tell when the Lord speaks to you? I know there's a good voice and a bad one as well. <laughs> well, it's by reason of use, the, the Bible says you... you uh, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit are there, and I, I recommend you, you read the Romans chapter 3, uh, the first Corinthians chapter 13, see what it says about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We, we believe in them and we see God working in them. Mm -hmm. Well, today's power meant is for the book of Numbers. And this is the ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. And remember, tomorrow is the Vox Populi, the voice of the people. You don't want to miss it. It'll be fun. See you.